Hello, beautiful people. You are listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food and Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, and my guest today is one of my favorite human beings in the entire galaxy, New York Times restaurant critic, Mr. Pete Wells. Hello, Kat. Hello, Pete Wells. Would you indulge me for a moment yes. and go on a journey? Yeah. <clears throat> this journey begins on a night... 20 years ago, yes. <laughs> 1998, December 31st, 1998. I remember it well. The moon was in the east. <laughs> Juliet was in the west. And, um, I had uh, recently started uh, dating a fellow with a, with a fine head of hair. This man here still has a fine head of hair. And uh, we'd been dating for a couple of weeks. And he said, uh, you know, we were playing this sort of casual cool like oh what are you doing for new year's eve i don't know what are you doing for new year's eve maybe do you want to meet up and go to a party and i thought yes yes i would do this it was 98 going into 99 we're all singing the prince songs and he said well i'm going to this party at the home of my friend pete wells and i was like oh yeah i think maybe i can show up and it got stuck in my head though pete wells pete wells pete wells where had i heard that name before i think does the audience know that at that point I was not globally famous yet? Oh, uh, this is was, this is all origin myth. Of, yeah, no. T- well, here's the thing: is because there might be people who think I was just born were, famous. You were I, fo- you were sprung from the head of Zeus. <laughs> I think so far as most people are concerned. But I I walked up the the five flights, six flights. How many flights was this? Six. I, I walked up six flights um, into the lair. Of, of this Mr. Pete Wells, and, and uh, he was wearing a, uh, a yellow shirt that I remember thinking that was browser safe because we thought of these things in 1998. And, and there was a giant vat of, of punch that was, was being served at the time. Do you remember the particular kind of punch it was? I don't, but it might have been a fish house punch. I couldn't remember. It was Schuylkill punch, fish house punch, something like it that. Might have, it might have been, because I liked the fish house punch recipe a lot because it was so simple and dramatic and it mostly involved opening like three or four different kinds of liquor and pouring them into the punch bowl and then walking away. The punch bowl, which I seem to recall, was a stock pot. Well, that was punch bowl. <laughs> well, you know, punch bowl is in quotes, yeah. It was kept out on the fire escape uh, to remain chilly, and I thought that was a really great piece of hospitality innovation. But the name stuck in my head. I was thinking, Pete Wells, Pete Wells, Pete Wells. Why do I know this? Uh, yeah, at this point, I'm 26 years old. I know not much of the world. I uh, had moved to New York City a couple of years before. And then a couple weeks later, it dawned on me. We were all out. I was I was terrified of you the first time I met you. I'm just going to put well, that Well, rightly there. so. You are a very terrifying yeah, person. I had my, whole... my whip and my dagger. And... All, and all all of these things plus more. Um, and, and finally, I got up the courage to ask you, Pete Wells, is there some reason there would have been an entire issue of Sassy Magazine themed around you? I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> <laughs> would you please there explain was, to fact. the listeners how and why there is an entire issue of Sassy Magazine with For the Love of Pete Wells on the Spine for everybody in the masthead to say, like, Jane Pete Wells Pratt, etc. And the and the definition of a Pete Wells I, as a boy who you were way more into than you are into him. Sort of. It was like, a, it, we didn't have the word ghosting yet, but I guess I kind of ghosted somebody at Sassy and she definitely like uh, got back at me in a in a pretty awesome way. You and this was that had been in what year? Mm, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know. Early nineties, let's say. Okay. So, th- but this all goes to say that you did not, in fact, <clears throat> spring fully formed. Uh, there was a Pete Wells before there was capital. Pete Wells. So <laughs> let us let us go back in time to yes. your to your editorial journey because everybody wants to know how do you become you? Yeah. Uh, right. I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. It definitely was not like um, it was not planned <laughs> at all in any way until maybe about five minutes before I started doing it. 
Because when I when I met you in 1998, as I recall, you were working you were working in some capacity at the New Yorker, and you were writing bar and country music reviews for Time Out. Yeah, that was great. That was fun. I wish I could pull out these these Time Out reviews because even uh, the guy I was dating. Um, hello, Stephen Stern. How you doing today? Um, still, still lovely lovely friend um but he was in awe of of you as we all were but you weren't in awe of you at the time uh, as i recall but there were there the, it were these little gems of reviews about uh about bars dive bars a yeah lot mostly of- dive bars because when i tried to do bars that thought they were nice i i, I just tore them to shreds I, you know <laughs> it was a fun because it was a, it was before the um what we call the cocktail revolution mm-hmm. now so the way that a cocktail bar is nice now is by having nice cocktails, but at the time they didn't really know how to do that, so they would just do ridiculous, pretentious things and have like thirty-five flavors of flavored vodka, <laughs> and you know our twist on the Cosmo, and all these things that were just totally beside the point to me. The, all, the, all this like, you know, decor, like sort of think of Sex in the City and what would have drawn them to a bar and which was like just not uh my speed i guess <laughs> so I, I, w- I would try to go to bars like that and i w- and i would just rip them apart and then i'd go to really any dive and then i d- at some point i discovered that what i really really was responding to was if the emptier the bar was the more i liked it <laughs> and then i thought about that and i thought maybe there's a deeper issue here yeah, that sh- should be explored outside of the realm of reviewing as they you used know? to say on tv the problem is in your set <laughs> the problem is is not but did i feel like you had written about somewhere in uh my neighborhood that was one of those places where the regulars line up at eight in the morning or oh on fifth avenue yes. yeah in those days there were some really amazing um um, bars along Fifth Avenue, and they've all kind of been O'Connor's closed and hipsterized. Well, O'Connor's was was, that was the a- most amazing. Bef- uh, and uh, but Timbo's or Timbo's, Timbo's yes, yeah, right by the OTB. Right. <laughs> and then there was one called uh, Jackie's Fifth Amendment. That was the one. Yes, yes, you they could were buy. All, they were all great, but they were they were just not. They weren't like. They weren't really like things that you could review you just sort of had to you had to go in and and live the experience and then come back and tell the tale but you couldn't like review it as as if it were an aesthetic experience you know the thing is these reviews are fundamental to me about who you are and who who you have become as a critic because the the Pete that I met in 1990 probably for a couple minutes in 1998 going into 1999 um, there was a quintessential story about you that friends told you had been going through a breakup and you spent it by uh, going to the fish market. And I and I, I sort of got to know you as a scholar of old New York in that particular way. I picture you in this very up in the old hotel kind of way. This might have just been legend. You, you, there was legend. Did I but still have the crayfish when you met me? You had a parrot i had the parrot but not the crayfish yeah i don't think you um i but yeah so pete also for backstory for pete pete for a very long time had a parrot who was a a, a lovely companion who i never actually got to meet oh ignatz so if you can ignatz was a good bird he, so you had him for how long um i'm not really sure I, I, I don't remember a couple of years he was he had belonged to somebody else in my building who needed to i guess deaccession his parrot and uh <laughs> divest and uh um uh and so i got him and then and i had him for a couple of years and then he he died really really suddenly and i was i remember that pretty, yeah. pretty upset and also surprised because he was supposed to have lived for 50 years or something mm-hmm. but he did not but ignatz ignatz talked a little bit he said hello and he said meow and then he had this bark that was kind of like if you took a like a toy poodle and then shrank it like f- to the size of a chipmunk like the bark that that dog would make and you would shower with ignats next question <laughs> i mean that's like you clean a bird um this this is all to say that when when i met you you were one i don't give this accolade to a huge amount of people 
but you're a really good New Yorker. And I, I think of the people who truly appreciate New York on all of the different levels, a person who would go to the Fulton Fish Market, a person who would be intimately acquainted with a bar um, out in, in Coney Island on, on the boardwalk, who appreciates all of, all of these things. Um, and the person I knew then, like, well, I knew the writing chops, the critical eye that you were developing, seeing you become a person who is the arbiter of uh, fancy a lot of times, who has <clears throat> the people have a notion of being uh, of, of the New York Times critic as being the person who leads them toward all of these different experiences, but has access in a way that a lot of people won't because you're making decisions for how people are going to spend their dollars, what is worth spending their money on. And while of course you review things all over the spectrum, you were the person who says it is okay or not okay to save up your money and go to this particular place. How did you become comfortable with that? I don't know, I mean, boy, I don't know if I, am totally comfortable with it in 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 just in terms of like how much of my job that should become mm -hmm. you know because um it is inescapable there are more right but the, but like there are more and more like very high-end restaurants opening chart you know where like sort of just to walk in the door it's 200 dollars before you've had a drink and and uh and you know, a few years ago, I could count those on one hand, and now I, I don't think I could even name them all without, you know, having to go and, and look them up. There's a lot of them. Do I have to review every single one of them? I mean, th there's a maybe expectation that the Times should do that because we're the ones who can do that. So we have the That's budget, the thing. right? Yes. We have the budget, yeah. and not Isn't a lot of duty? people have the budget, and, you know, and, and, and we do it thoroughly, too. Like, I go three times I'm just doing, I'm about to write this weekend I'm about to write a review of a tasting menu place that's about 200 seems almost like a bargain in wow. a weird way yeah and, and <laughs> happy and, uh, 2019 right. everyone <laughs> um, and I went three times like we always do and they have they change their month their menu the first of every month so I went in January and February and then just went again for my March visit so I've had three completely different meals at this restaurant that some people might it might be a once in a lifetime experience and for a lot of people of course they'll never yeah. think about going um so there's this sense that because the times can do that we've got the resources to set aside to do it that it's kind of our responsibility to 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 to, to tell people which 250 300 meals are worth it and i'm not sure it is really just i in fact I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not that's not like if that comes at the exclusion of something else then it's not which it does uh then um it's definitely not so i have to pick my shots a lot more carefully i think than even when i started this job just because there's there's a lot of stuff that that the average person would look at and say, well, that's, I would never spend that much money on dinner. I, you know, I, I always go back to that Craig Claiborne, like $4,000 uh, dinner that yeah. I, ha, have they priced that for today? Gosh, no, I, I, it wouldn't be that hard to do. I mean, uh, <laughs> Is it, like a uh, 16, it would be <laughs> probably, probably around 20, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That it's, you know, and that's one of those things where he knew he, I come back to to, uh, to Craig Claiborne a lot. You know this. Yeah. <laughs> Knowing my, I, I have a very particular love of the critics of your of, yeah. of Craig Claiborne of Seymour yeah, Fritchke. Sh we share we share that. I mean, I think about Claiborne a lot too because he in invented my job. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, like that. Well, that's sort of that's sort of interesting. Like, why did he do that? Well, he knew it would get him on the front page. That's yeah. probably all the reason any. Times journalist ever needs to do anything, you know. Right. Um, but I think there was also, like, he knew that people would be shocked and appalled, and he didn't think that was necessarily bad because, yeah. you know, uh, I think he wanted he wanted Americans to think about how much value they placed on food as opposed to other things, and 
uh, you know, I'm not saying this was a, a think piece because it was kind of the farthest thing from it. It was yeah. just, was, and then we ate, and then we drank, you know. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, to have like New York Times readers like, so you know, standing outside with like torches and pitchforks over a story about a really expensive meal is maybe a useful exercise to say like, well, you know, you don't think a four thousand dollar car is an expensive car. Actually, I don't know what, I mean, 4000 <laughs> at the time would have been, yeah, that would have That'd been a, pricey, a yeah. nice car, but maybe not a caddy with that. <laughs> I, what year, what year did that happen? It was the 60s? 64, yeah. 66, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because I remember there was an anniversary recently. The thing also that sticks in my head about him and about you and, a, and, a, and, a, and about me is that I've always had this sense of sneaking in the back door. Craig Claiborne was from, was it Sunflower, Mississippi? <laughs> That's right, I think. I Sunflower, think was, Mississippi, yeah. and was always acutely aware of the fact that he had to create this persona, that he came from this place that was not fancy and had to create this character. Um, yeah. Most of I feel like most... Yeah, he was not... He was not you know, born with a ticket to the New York Times in his hand. No, no, he he was so unlikely. He was a, I believe, closeted um, a guy who'd grown up um, in, God, I've just had a flash of the disturbing part of his memoir. Don't read that part. Uh, I was going to mention this. Yeah. Um, but grew up with a very um, present mother in a boarding house in there and learned to appreciate food in a particular way. But he was incredibly self-taught in a way. And I sort of realized that a lot of my favorite food writers feel like they sneaked in the back door. Josh Zazerski used to talk about this a lot. He wrote actually a very long piece about that because there was maybe at one point a traditional trajectory you get an internship at one of the big glossies or at a newspaper and then um, this tiny rarefied bunch of people are the people who become the arbiter of taste for the whole uh, country i've always felt like a weird screw-up kid who stumbled into this by a lot of accident um how do you do you, do you, how do you feel about your journey into this? Like, did did you ever question yourself? Like, why is it me doing this? What is? I think. Well, I do. I, of course. I, I, yeah, I wake up every day and well, what's what's going on here? <laughs> Where am uh, I? Right, right. Are this you is, my dog? This is not my beautiful house. Uh, yeah, but um, you know that was the only way to get into it when we got into it. There was no. And path. what was it? There was no it. That's the thing. That's, I, I, I mean, it's really hard to explain. This. I, I want to talk about this because I think yeah, there, there are a lot of people right now talking about it. you know the food <laughs> world as if it was built and it wasn't <laughs> built it just sort of ha it came together because um uh i mean in a way it's like w w what what w w this town that employs <laughs> us it's, a, it's like a it's like a old west boom town that just sort of like like <laughs> shot up really quickly and was like oh we need you know we need those editors we need writers we need you know um, I mean, one of the reasons I got hired at Food and Wine back in 1999 was because I knew something about cocktails, and they'd never had any cocktail coverage. And now you can't really imagine like Food <laughs> and Wine being, you know, cocktail illiterate. Like it, you couldn't well, do it. So in '99, when you got this job, I had um, ever so slightly gotten over being afraid of you, and uh, you would, and you got you got this job at Food and Wine. And I was the first this thing from a writer um, at, at that point. I was this scrappy, weird web designer kid. I was I, I was working at um, Maxim Magazine. At the, yeah, Maxim Magazine. Yeah. At that point, I'd come from City Search, but I wasn't a writer. I was a designer, and I was too scared to call myself a writer. And then all of a sudden, and I wasn't. I, I always thought at some point you were just gonna take out your welding mask and go back to metal work. <laughs> oh, yeah, for people who don't know, my, my master's degree is in metal smithing. Uh, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, and this sort of world didn't exist, and I was really, I didn't think I could do any of this, and I was now falling into this crowd of this, this guy I was dating and all of his friends who were all fancy-ass writer uh, people, and I was incredibly intimidated by you, and then you got this job at food and wine and it was to me 
the most astonishing thing a person could do. I remember uh, we'd gone out to lunch together for the first time we ever hung out together, I think. I got back to my desk and my dad uh, loved food and wine and he sent me a note saying like, hey, there's this this guy, Pete Wells, who uh, looks like a young uh, John Travolta and I think you'd really like his writing. And I was like, dad, dad, I just had lunch with him. And he was so, you know, he was so impressed. And the notion that somebody that I knew could work at food and wine blew my mind. Did Were you confident that day that you walked in the door and thought like, you know, hey, yeah, I have something to say. I have a voice. I have something important. I can do this. Um, yeah, I don't know. No, I, I mean, I, I don't really know. What I was thinking about more was, was whether I could, could edit. Yeah. Because I had been a writer and all I cared about was being a writer and I, and I, um, uh, and I didn't want any career except a writer's career, and um, and nobody really was stepping up and saying, "Here, we will pay you a salary to be a writer." And, but Food and Wine did offer me a salary to be an editor, and I and I had to say, "I've never done this before, <laughs> and I don't really know anything about it except for what, like what I've seen people do when they're editing me." Yeah, and uh, um, and the and. Uh, Dana Cowan was running the magazine and uh, d- didn't care. She just thought I would figure it out. And then, you know, turned out at Food and Wine, you, uh, then you got a lot of uh, um, editorial oversight. So there, so um, uh, they they were, you know, there were layers of editors above me making sure that everything got so turned you're, into Food and Wine copy. So you were not without uh, a net. <laughs> right. No. No. It was, yeah. Well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but that that was like uh, that that made made me nervous, um, and I I don't think I was all that intimidated by the institution. But I also you know uh, I hadn't read it all that much at the time. <laughs> so. Sorry, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> I knew about it and I'd cooked from it, but I didn't really sit down and read it. You know. So you you did a, a thing that they were starting to do at the time, and I know this because I I would uh, ring into these all the time. You were doing these online chats. Oh my gosh! Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> in the, uh, right, which is sort of like just like what we're doing right now. Yeah, I think that, this like, is now. <laughs> you have somebody with a laptop, and then questions would pop up from like yeah. Marge in Minnesota. Yeah, and you could ask Pete Wells anything and I, I would go on there in character sometimes and just like ask you <laughs> your questions about what about what you were doing and cocktail questions a lot of because uh, I don't know if people have intuited this by now but we both like a cocktail <laughs> and uh, yeah um, and it was it felt like something experimental and fun and you started writing some things for food and wine that didn't feel very food and wine because they were fairly uh, pers- they they had more personality in some they had more uh, first person in them you went on an adventure with captain bacon oh gosh and you won a james beard award for this as i recall yeah yeah that bacon yeah yeah that bacon piece was was funny let's talk about that it was just like it was um uh you know, early days of bacon mania probably yes. helped you know, he, light a fire it, under bacon mania. He stoked the bacon fire yeah. as you were to blame right. for so much. Right, and <laughs> Captain Bacon had invented the Bacon of the Month Club, which was real. Was was one of the first times that that somebody said like, you know, there's there's a, there could be there could be a bacon lifestyle if you want it, you could join the bacon lifestyle, and that just blew people's minds, you know, um, and uh, uh, so he he sold all this bacon, but he had never met uh, the people who made it. Um, uh, Captain Bacon, his name is Dan Phillips, uh, had just had, hadn't met. The, all the smokehouse people. So we went out to Kentucky and Tennessee and and r- like really rural parts of the states because this was you know where the pigs were. <laughs> and, uh, you went through Kentucky a certain amount, and you yeah, were yeah. was it mostly or was it Tennessee as well or Kentucky and Tennessee? And he insisted that you shower. Well, that was that was you know 
part of the rules. That was part of the rules. But once you get on the road, you know, the rules become flexible. (laughs) But I I remember it was it was such a funny thing because I was in awe of all of this. Like, again, I had never in a million years dreamed that I would become a writer or an editor, much less work at, at food and wine. And I remember coming over to your house for a taste test. You were doing a sausage taste test and a bacon taste test. Oh, that was after this trip, I think. Yes. I brought back the country bacon and country sausage, which for people who don't know is is, uh, not like the bacon and sausage that we have in this part of the country, nor that we make. So it's... uh, um, it, like the sausage would be typically like um, ground up pork and salt and then put it in a bag and hang it in a smokehouse and let it drip and, sm- and smoke it really heavily. Um, and, the, and the ham and the bacon are sort of the same. You just cover them with salt and hang them in a smokehouse and let them drip. And so it's a much drier, more intense and much smokier style than anything like that I knew in the Northeast where we... Um, put ham and bacon in brine and and uh, ho- hold it under, and that's why how you get these sort of soggy, but wonderful Easter hams. And that's why our our bacon, when you touch it, is kind of wet um, uh, and spits a lot in the pan. Um, and so this was like a like a new world of pork love, you know, <laughs> a whole new world. <laughs> but. You were doing that. You were doing this taste test at your house. I remember there were little bits of paper towel to so- soak up the grease and stuff. How'd no, no, you... no. I had you there to soak up the grease. I was just soaking up the grease, man. And again, in awe. And we were um, drinking, I think, some rum or some bourbon at the time. But also, who taught you how to taste test? Had you been part of one of those before? Because honestly, that's how I learned to run a taste test oh, at really? a magazine was watching you do that. Who taught you how to do that? Well, I think it was a, it was a thing that would happen in like the food and wine test kitchen pretty often. They would, you know, um, sometimes it, the, like products would just roll in and somebody would say, oh, here's five salsas. Let's, let's stick a chip in it. And, uh, um, uh, and then I don't remember, hmm, I don't remember doing any wine tastings. Uh, um, somewhere along the line, though, I'd, I'd kind of uh, just got gotten the the um, uh, what's the word? I guess the there's a uh, routine of blind tasting where you know ideally nobody who's doing the tasting knows which bacon is number six you know so Mm -hmm. so that's what blind means and then and then also blind is like you 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 don't have anything in front of you Mm -hmm. and no one's told you what flavors you're going to be tasting so you're you're kind of blind in that sense you're just going into your own head to, to come up with descriptions for what you're tasting and and uh and how they're how each thing is different from the last thing it's it's just it's it's pretty i mean it's pretty standard i don't know where i read it but it's a super valuable exercise and 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 you know i think more people should do it actually i think all these people who you know really spend a lot of money on their liquor cabinets for instance like you know taste five six ten there's not too many bourbons (laughs) side by side it's really interesting to taste vodka side by side gin side by side is really interesting you learn a lot well we have i mean we have a privilege to work at publications where they will buy all all of all of these things but it's it's a fun thing where if you if you don't come from this world you don't sort of see behind the veil and see how all of these these things are necessarily done so it had been a really eye-opening thing for me to see how you know, how this is done that but there that there is a, a method yeah, that there's, yeah. That there's and now it's just you know it's commonplace that's what we do and i think some of the people coming into it now just you know they they just take it as part for the course because they you know maybe have seen a lot of videos about it there's a lot of video out there now of people testing things uh-huh. but there are a lot of things that we sort of had to learn i mean this stuff had been in place for you know the magazines for you know that had been around for a thousand years for um you know the the newspapers and stuff did it but it was it was just sort of a look behind the veil for for, for me, you know, starting out, you know, in this thing, I mean, some of it we get, some of it we we get from, uh, uh, I mean, some of it we get from the, like the world of of uh, you know distillers mm-hmm. who would sit 
in a room and taste through a, a line and, and some of it we get from um, consumer advocates and things like like consumer reports mm-hmm. um, uh, which really emphasize this rigorous methodology and and the, the uh, you know the the blind or sometimes the double blind mm-hmm. tasting and and uh, um, uh, and that was all kind of maybe new to the food world, uh, to food to food journalism. I mean, not when when I was doing it, it wasn't new anymore. But it was at some point it was yeah. new. Where, where I'd like, like to find the person who sort of came up with uh, like the methodology. I'm sure is probably like one of those women's magazines that have been around for a long time, a Family Circle, uh, you know, a Better Homes, uh, you know, something like that. I, I'd be curious to figure that out. I'm curious too now that now that we're talking about it. I mean, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, uh, it's a sci- it's it's part of the lineage of food writing that we don't I think give enough respect to but that's where Mimi Sheraton came from she yeah. came out of a really strong like like um, uh, consumerist point of view and, and making sure the consumer really got the best value for their money um, and took a kind of hard-nosed skeptical approach to, to everything she did including restaurants and, and had you know, really wanted to, you know, felt that the consumer needed to be protected from from restaurant fraud, which would, would at the time just meant you know, bad steak or something. You know, <laughs> like not not true yeah. true. Fr- I mean, there is true fraud, but that was you know, her, the the idea was some of these restaurants are worth your money and some of them are not, and you work hard for your money, and uh, and we, the New York Times, are going to try to help you make smarter choices. Yeah, let's talk through that lineage. So it was it was Craig first. Was it was it Mimi after him? Craig first. Craig was the first to um, uh, kind of codify the restaurant reviews. There were um, restaurants were written about before Claiborne. Yeah, I mean Clementine Paddleford was out there in her little plane. Right, not for us, but yeah, for (laughs) for whoever she wrote for. um, uh, What was the syndicate she wrote for? Oh, it was a different. It was a different. Yeah, um, uh, and then but but you know we had uh, I think the food editor before Craig was Jane Nickerson, and she did a lot of the um, all-purpose coverage, cooking and restaurants, and what was going on in the world of food trends, and and um, and I believe she wrote what you'd kind of consider halfway between a restaurant report and a review Mm -hmm. but I mean that's what I do that's what I do too it's the same thing you just go in and you tell people what it's like Mm -hmm. and you know maybe there's a little bit more opinion once you start calling it a restaurant review but they can always I mean there was always a way to sneak opinion in so but but Craig was the one who kind of you know Codified it, made it weekly, which was really crucial, mm-hmm. and put and then that, then put stars on it, which was uh, like the thing that made it kind of uh, uh, icon. Uh, yeah. That's not funny, but, uh, but you know, made it the stars. Some made the New York Times reviews like uh, a cultural, like yeah. you know. Um, establishment institution and it was funny I mean if people really look back in it and they you know and they and they're questioning decisions you made about why did you review this place whatever you have to look back and see he reviewed chock full of nuts yeah That's... chock full of nuts well they have that really good date bread yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and with the cream cheese on it and uh, and uh, yeah he gave that a star and, and then uh, the <laughs> same week I think gave Lutas which was one of the great oh, French restaurants of its, its era. It's my great one star. regret yeah. that I, you know, I, I make a point of trying to go to some of these institutions before, like while I still can, because I have the tremendous regret of not having gone to Lutes. I spent a week a few years ago going to some of these places that I was nervous were going to go away. I went back to, I went to La Grande which I loved. I went to 21, which I did not love so as much. <laughs> and, um, I and love being at 21. I do too. I love I, being at 21. I, I love. I saw Chelsea Clinton there when I was there, oh. and I went to Russian Tea Room that same, that same week in Sardi's, and uh, and just because I, I think it's really important to honor uh, some of these places that have been around for a long time. Um, I, I think of you as the kind of s- current steward of this uh, position because it is a thing with with a long 
legacy. And because it is a thing with a long legacy that has had various people in the role, uh, it turns it in some ways more into an institution or, or a character than the actual human involved. I think to a lot of people, you're, um, you're not a real person. Nobody who works at the New York Times is a, a real person to, to, uh, to the rest of the world. Can we talk about that for a second, what it means to be the idea Oof. of I mean, Pete there's a Wells. lot to say about that. There's a lot to say about that. A lot that, of people have written like, a lot of words. <laughs> you, with, um, uh, you know, I had a, this, like, um, flash of insight. <laughs> Honestly, like, you know, I think most of the times when when people write, and then I suddenly realized that it's ridiculous. Nobody <laughs> the suddenly, Carrie Bradshaw voice. <laughs> right, nobody suddenly realizes anything. You either, like you've always thought it and then you start thinking more about it or you, like or somebody tells you but you never suddenly realize anything but in this case I suddenly realized that the word that describes the relationship of a lot of our readers to the New York Times is projection and so the I mean the Times is like if you if you know anything about like um, uh, Freud's theories of transference like the New York Times is the perfect object of transference you know it it just represents authority and everything that people hate in their lives <laughs> and all of the arbitrary rules and all of the hidden power and the and the people in in uh, high rooms in uh, in in the you know alleys of Manhattan making decisions that affect millions all of that stuff is the New York Times and and uh, um, and it makes people go insane I mean yeah. we've seen like there's a lot of craziness in our culture around you know the New York Times and and uh, the failing New York Times right there's a, <laughs> yeah and uh, um, uh, but also you know like like you see it even in 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 readers who don't know they're crazy, you know, who don't who don't know <laughs> that they have a somewhat, you know, people have feelings they, about yeah, you. People don't understand that the, that their relationship with the New York Times is is clouded by these feelings of, of transference and projection. So um, I get letters that are really angry, indignant, and and disrespectful. They don't start, dear Mister Anything. They just <laughs> launch into hey, you asshole. moron. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, and so, and I know this because when I write back to them, I usually do unless some are just too rude and you don't bother, but yeah. I usually write back. <laughs> and then they're like shocked. That you're a human being? They're shocked that a human read it, took the time to respond, and which must mean that a human wrote the thing that made them so angry in the first place, which must mean that maybe there's some fallibility in how well, the people do after all make mistakes or people actually have opinions that are other than the ones we hold <laughs> and and all you know and it's not just a case of the New York Times trying to make you have a bad day, right? Or, <laughs> Is that you know, not what you're trying no, to do? You're you not know. trying to ruin everybody's lives, the chefs, the restaurateurs, no, it's the so readers. Fr- the the <laughs> there's a, you know, they're... they're, um, they're you are a destroyer of... <laughs> be well destroyer of worlds. <laughs> destroyer of worlds. One of the... Um, <laughs> Food discussion boards in the back when back when these were kind of vibrant and, and well uh, well attended places. One of those food, food discussion boards had this um, I, just one of their articles of faith was the New York Times does not like French restaurants. <laughs> so whoever was the critic obviously yeah. was handed a sheet, and on it was like. We don't like French restaurants, and we, right? And we were all supposed to follow that. Who's so it was like me? it was nuts. It was like the the Salzburger family like got together and and said, "Oh, make sure you tell the critic we don't like French restaurants." <laughs> <laughs> like it, it's like this they're turning to have like freedom fries. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, that's like there is just there's an idea that the institution kind of functions in the in the in this in this like you know three days of the condor level where they're they're like you know conspiracies inside conspiracies and and people 
b b pulling strings that no, that you don't even know are being pulled. You know, it's not like that. <laughs> at all it's just a bunch of people trying to do their job like it really 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 is including all the things that drive uh, readers insane the political coverage and what they see as bias it's just somebody trying to do their job as best they can and i'm not even being paid to say that <laughs> it's the you're truth you're not gonna have like the ombudsman <laughs> come down on your neck for for saying that it's such a it's been such a weird thing as somebody who's known you for a long time and you know knows you as a human being to see you being turned into an idea of something to a character to the point where there was one year that there were two different very long profiles of you one you know in which for the new yorker in which i you know spoke with the the writer at length for this and you know and it was funny you know i only had a couple little things in there and still we spent a fairly long time and then one where it was about the one a james beard award in in thrillist for the about the idea of who, who this person thought you were that's a burden to bear individually imagine if some people have the notion of you as this creature and i, I know i i, I text you every time I am watching a sitcom I watch a lot of sitcoms and they have this thing of like oh no the New York Times critic is coming in or your name was actually shouted out on Younger I believe when I you, heard about that yeah. yeah what how does that feel when all of a sudden and might have something to do with the fact that you're anonymous but that, that the notion that you're this idea in people's heads this character this this something as separate from the New York Times you in particular and there's a fascination around well, you. Well, I don't actually think it. I actually don't think it's it's about me in particular at all. And I think the day that I'd argue it the is the day that I that I ha hang up my hat and or, or the hat is rested. I hang up the, cold, the uh, dead dear hands. stalker. You know, when, on the on the day that that uh, <laughs> that I have to hand this job off to the next critic. Uh, I just will return to civilian life, and I, and it won't even be like an ex-president. I won't have secret <laughs> the walls. service following me <laughs> around at all. It'll just be it'll just be me, and and uh, um, and everybody will obsess about the next person. It's just, it's like being. Oh gosh, I don't I I don't even know you. It's like you I, I don't know what to compare it to because you, you're. Um, I mean, it's a little bit like political power, where like the president, yeah, gets us gets secrets, and, all, and you know, the ex presidents are a small club, and but you know, the the let's take the, you know, the ex, um, you know, uh, speaker of the house, like <laughs> who cares? <laughs> Let us not speak of Dennis Hastert. <laughs> right? Well, no, let's not. Like, uh, like, like the, the once you lost the power. Nobody cares. I, I, you know what? I argue differently here well, because I'm they all sell freaking memoirs. Life. I'm going to try to. I'm good gonna ones, try to, I will say. Yeah, I'm going to try to be, you know, relevant in some <laughs> way. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It, well, so you mentioned you invoked the president here. I like to think you have as much or more power than the current one. Oh, no. no, uh, no yeah. uh, they, there's a tradition of them exchanging these notes, leaving a note in the in the drawer. I and there's actually a bit I can't separate from fact or fiction, or like whether it happened in the West Wing or it happened in real life. The flak jacket that the press secretary has, where they leave notes in the pocket of that, um, is, is right. <laughs> is it TV or is it real? I mean, yeah, yeah, really hard to it tell. It should these be days. real. <laughs> um, but is there any sort of passing down of institutional knowledge, at least within the times that that happens? Well, sure. I mean, I think. I mean, when I started, I went and talked to all my all my living predecessors. And <laughs> oh, li yeah. So is, is, wait, so Craig is, is no longer with He's his, no is longer Brian's with us. Brian Miller still, actually didn't talk to Brian, I, I should, but, but he, Maybe Brian, Ruth, Brian is still Sam, around. Frank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. that all that, that has been, and, and well, you know, there are some who had very short stays in the 70s. There's, um, um, <laughs> it was the 70s. John Hass, who, uh, uh, wrote that great book about um, the American, I can't remember what it was called. Really great book about sort of the state of American food in the '70s, which like they thought was really bad. Uh, <laughs> um, so he was our critic for a while, but he died of, uh, more than a few years ago. Did there might have been somebody was else. Was Johnny Apple who, still around when you took the job, or when did he? He die? he died right before I started okay. at the Times. And or maybe right after I started at the Times. So they, you know, they shared some knowledge, some insight, and then 
Uh, recently, you were kind enough to, um, Saleh Ho was starting her new um, position, and I put you two in touch because I knew, you know, this was a new and big thing, and you were, and I, I sort of made some joke about the secret cabal of all <laughs> the critics getting together and uh, deciding things. Um, how much interaction is there between uh, the critics? I don't know how useful that is city to city, but... Um. Is there a you know, I try to stay in touch secret with secret text groups. <laughs> no, yeah, I try to stay in touch with 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 there. There are a few around the country I stay in touch with just because I like them. And mm-hmm. and uh, um, but there's no there's not really a cabal except in the sense that you know um, when uh, somebody in one part of the country has managed to get their editor to sign off on a on a story about like what's new in San Francisco. Well, they're going to call the San Francisco critics right so there there's like there's a little bit of an echo chamber in the uh, uh in the in the way that national coverage gets done um uh but it's the farthest thing from a cabal you know? <laughs> which and i say that because you know people, I mean, people maybe think the beard, there's a grand <laughs> maybe the beard restaurant committee is the closest thing to an actual cabal in the food world because uh, it's it's sort of this floating body around the country. <laughs> it's, who knows where the Brigadoon is going right. to land because they do travel around. But there is a passing on of knowledge that happens, too. I've seen you be very generous with uh, so talking to some of the, the newer people in, in the field. and Because I know that there's got to be some exhaustion and burnout that happens with this, I look at your job. Are and you trying to tell me that it's time for me <laughs> to take I, someone aside and and give them the keys? No, not even. I want you to do this to <laughs> your grave. But the thing is, I want your grave to be very, very, very far away. I look at. I'm going to read a passage here. If you will bear with me for one second, I'm going to be reading this off my phone. I have uh, texted this to various people. You and I have uh, talked about this uh, before. Let me pull it up. It's a Craig Claiborne uh, quote. Uh, from from a feast made for laughter. And he said, and to tell the truth, I was bored with restaurant criticism. At times I didn't give a damn if all the restaurants in Manhattan were shoved into the East River and perished. Had they all served nightingales, tongues on toast, and heavenly manna and bread, there is only so much that the tongue can savor, so much that the human body and spirit can accept, and then it resists. Toward the end of my days as restaurant critic, I found myself increasingly indulging in drink, the better to endure another evening of dining out i had become a desperate man with a frustrating job to perform and that's craig claiborne in 1982 so that's I not have, <laughs> i know it's not a pretty picture i have never talked to i've never talked to a, a restaurant critic who reached that stage of burnout there was somebody who quit recently and i sent him that i don't remember who that was somebody in, in washington or something who decided to step aside because he, and he wrote a piece about it because he was so tired it's tiring. There's running around town. If you're, I mean, I think if you're doing it right, you run around town a lot. Um, uh, I think I could always be doing more traveling, and getting we out all to more could neighborhoods. Always and, be and, doing more. <laughs> I mean, your, I don't even think about um, traveling around the country, but just traveling uh, around New York. Like, like, uh, you know, when was the last time I was in Astoria? It's been a while. You know, like, uh, um, there's always more to do, but. I the for me the the thing that keeps me from um, getting bored with the job in ge- in the general way is just that there's so much variety yeah. here. Maybe if it weren't New York, maybe if it were 1968 yeah. eight or 69, when he was writing, and there were there were maybe I don't know. Let's guess how many different cuisines did did Claiborne have to choose from? Maybe yeah. twenty, yeah, maybe was- twenty cuisines. You know, um, and now there's like over a hundred and I can't even you know I, I can't even count them all I'm surprised by them all the time I just did my fr- or next week I'll be doing my first Albanian restaurant which is very exciting oh that's exciting yeah 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 I know um, uh, so I don't know who could get bored if you're if you're getting bored I think it's just a sign that you're you're not trying hard enough yeah I can't understand getting exhausted because it's and it's I can r- understand sort of a physical fatigue because it's it does place a strain on your body and you have to be real about it are there some nights that you just don't we think like god 
damn it, I have to go and do this again. Yeah, that usually has more to do with the... It's usually more to do with the, all of the social requirements of being out in public, which include, you know, wearing have, pants. Oh, screw it. He's not wearing... <laughs> just so you all know, he's not wearing pants right now. It's, I have seen him wear a caftan at, at my house. I will put that out there. Um, but yeah, you Everyone have, looks good in a caftan. Everybody does. And it's really... It's, after you've had a big meal, it is... Oh, it's very forgiving. And I actually do remember a night when you put on my uh, faux fur coat and walked around a restaurant and nobody batted an eye because because that is part of the great joy of the anonymity of <laughs> that, coat, that coat was, I thought it really it looked, suited me. It looked really good on yeah. you. Um, but there, you know, with, with all of this, you have seen this evolution of, of New York dining. You tweeted something yesterday that this is the first time that you've been writing that there was not a Mar- Mario Batali restaurant. I know that just feels like an epoch, you yeah. know, or epoch. Maybe I should stick with words I know. It's the end of an era. It's the but it is it, 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 somehow that didn't seem dramatic enough. But it's definitely the end of an era. The the, the uh, um, in a really dramatic way. Well, and you've had to. This is also speaking of of the crock wearer in the room. This has changed how you have had to cover certain aspects of restaurants has changed in the time that you have been what year did you start as the critic uh 2012 okay you have in that time and especially in the last year and a half or you know maybe longer taken to account the politics of what has happened in the restaurant world around it uh you know and when you're doing a restaurant where there has been somebody controversial at the helm or in uh in that it, it has it has changed some of the things you have had to look at. Can you talk about that? Having to, so it, I think restaurants, you know, they were always about the culture. Some were more about the food and the decor and the experience, but this it is a lot more uh, sort of political context that has to go into this. Is, would you find that's true? Um, I'm not even sure political is the right way to put it i mean if, if you're talking about yeah maybe like maybe ethical? moral ethical maybe like because like what's political about not wanting not wanting to you know work not wanting to to spend your money in a business that treats its employees badly no, what's true. like that's right. i don't think that's a little left or right yeah thing uh um uh but Ooh, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that's out there on the surface now, and it's not because we care about you know sexual harassment or assault in the workplace all of a sudden overnight. We always it's just we know we've cared for a long time, we but we, yeah, we, it's people are willing to talk about it, and that's been the transformative change yeah. that that um, people have been willing to talk mostly to reporters mm-hmm. about what they say Mario has had done to them or what they say that John Besh had done to them and then boy when it's out in the open how do you go to that restaurant and not wrestle with it yeah. how do you like how and was do you I go to the restaurant to, in the first place or do you go to the restaurant in the first place which I also which I also you know had to had to think through so and I thought that through before I went and did the Four Seasons where one of the owners and not just an owner but like yeah, basically the, legendary. the public face of that restaurant Julian Nicolini who was 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 the one you called if you wanted a quote he was the he was the one who was in every every story about you know what was going on at the Four Seasons he was very and, and very gregarious sort in his in his better moods and uh um and was usually on the floor of the restaurant you and very often the person who greeted you when you came in if you're special enough took you, to your ta- <laughs> took you to your table but he was there and looked you over and uh uh and you know had to plead guilty to uh, uh, an assault charge uh, that was brought by a a uh, woman who was said that he just you know attacked her when she was standing at the bar Ugh. and how so do i go into that do I, that so that restaurant had a very expensive move and makeover rebuilt itself in a new address 
unrelated to the assault charges. This was a, a real estate deal. They had to move. But they show up at the new address, and seemingly everything is the same, and Julia Nicolini is still, you know, uh, in all of the, you know, press and PR materials, and what he's not doing is circulating on the floor. I found mm-hmm. out when I went, he was he was staying off in the wings, but there was, nobody had said he's not going to be on the floor eventually. Nobody had said, you know, we, we've, you know, we appreciate Julian's services, but he'll be kind of overseeing this from a remote location, <laughs> right? So there was always the sense that he could come back at any moment, and then like, what kind of meal would that be you yeah. know i mean i never found out because I, I as i said i never saw him when i went to the restaurants but you have to think it was a possibility and like do you, how good are you going to feel eating your you know 60 dollar pasta with truffles if there's this you know kind of guy who's done like nasty stuff to a customer of the restaurant How, like I and anyway I, you know I, the more I thought about it the more I thought like, God, this is just has to be dragged out in public there's no point in not reviewing the restaurant mm-hmm. the the better you know the, the at least the, the the more useful thing to do is to try to work this out in the in the context of a review yeah. work it just work it out and and think through it which is what critics are supposed to do and and try to come to some conclusion of course you can't reconcile the things you know this appetizer was delicious the host is a convicted you know criminal uh you can't make those things come together but you can hold them in opposition and 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 try to try to draw some conclusions out of that. That's my Morrissey problem. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I mean, that, right. I yeah, think it's easier it's, in a way. In a way, it's, it's easier. The, it's the giving with, money. It's easier yeah. with art, especially art that was made at some point in the yeah. past. It's oh easier. no, I didn't buy tickets to his uh, residency. Um, right. That uh, that went on. They're going on sale today, and I am abstaining from that. Right. So, but I mean, I watch movies made by some really nasty men. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, it's it to me that's not as much of a of a quandary as like you know what, what like what do I do with my with my money tonight? You know? Yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot of legwork that goes on ahead of time with this because, and I, I find myself doing this a lot where, you know, I think about oh, I'm gonna I gonna work with uh, you know I'm gonna work on something about this place, cover this thing, and I do the legwork first to see like okay, they say that they have done these things. There are a lot of these things that are cosmetic where I noticed that I had been getting press releases from the Four Seasons. Here are our women. And, you know, and, and there yeah, are... Yeah, there's a lot of window dressing oh, and a lot of statements that don't say anything and a lot of, you know, promises of of reform that sort of sound okay and don't mean anything. There's, there's a, and there's a, there's a lot of, of work behind the scenes about sussing uh, that out. And we're recording this today on International Women's Day. I can't tell you how many press releases I got about all the females in this particular restaurant industry uh. and, and, and whatnot. And I was just like, I will do none of it. My, uh, my International Women's Day move today was to get some dude not to lean back on the pole and mash my knuckles. It's the little victories. What pole? Oh, at uh, the subway. Oh, okay. Not the other pole. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the private life. And, and, uh, but, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of work that goes into these things. So let's actually talk through what your what your week looks like moving up to a review the because you have to make all of these decisions about what you're going to cover, what you're not going to cover, how you scope the places you're going to, how you you know go to the places. So let, let's go through a week in the life of Pete Wells. Oh god, do we have to? Yes. It's going to be so miserable for anybody who's still listening that I, <laughs> it's it's just it's such there's so much drudgery i can't even tell you there's so much of like um just so much of it is scheduling and staring at the calendar and trying to figure out you know which restaurant i need to go to on which day with which people and who's going to be available and will it is it going to add up to me having a restaurant review a month from now 
you know, it, it's it's really it's really. This is important. Really, actually, this is the important stuff to talk about. I think it may actually be three dimensional chess. You know, <laughs> everyone says, "Oh, it's not three dimensional chess." I think this might be. Yes, and that's the thing that people people. A, a friend wrote a piece recently that had a big actually. Uh, Corsha Wilson, we'll say it. Corsha Wilson wrote yeah, yeah. this, you know, this piece, and she was then afterwards, you know, dealing with everybody's reaction to it. And I said they see that you ran this marathon, they didn't see all the training for it, so they don't know how much intellectual, emotional, all the labor that went into something. People only see the end product of, of what this is. So I think this is valuable for people to to listen to who see that there there is this review that is however many hundred words. How many hours would you say goes into a review? Uh, oh boy, I don't know. I mean, that per se I mean, review. How many hours went into that, that like, per se review? Uh, well, a lot. Um, uh, I mean, we have the, the Times has had a rule that any starred review has to be written off of at least three visits, mm -hmm. and we've had that rule since Claiborne. I think he he came up with it, and uh, and I think it's like I think it's like one of the most famous things about my job, and yet. There are probably a lot of people who don't know that, uh, mm -hmm. who, who think, you know, I go because sometimes I write it and you could you could think I just went once. Sometimes I'm explicit about the second time I thought this and the third time I thought that. But I've seen you torture yourself debating. Uh, to, right? Uh, how much am I going to lead people <laughs> through my process? How much am I going to like recreate the history? I saw your heart of, of darkness of journey <laughs> through uh, through through the per se review. A little bit, and, yeah. And a actually, bit. you. Uh, texting me this, this was some in the new yorker article but like you texted me about going to send your frogs and i was like is this a cry for help don't pretend that you didn't also go to send your oh frogs. no no i will not but at first I, w I was seriously trying to figure out is pete okay because he's talking about going to send your frogs but then i was never more okay in my life this, the, and the thing is Here's the thing. I ended up on Twitter talking to people about this in Twitter. I know you have feelings about Twitter, but I was talking with people about it who thought that you were going for an easy dunk or something. And I wrote back. I was like, I can legitimately say that I have never seen this friend, this longtime friend of mine. I don't think I've ever seen you happier or freer or more giddy than the night we went to Senor Frogs and danced in a conga line with balloon hats on our heads with Jason Biggs right there along with us. And yeah, it was a, <laughs> that was just a magical, magical night in a not very good restaurant. Like something just, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, but it was, I mean, I was thinking about this the other day. Like, why did I do that? It, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was kind of fun to read, I hope, but it was also like, you know, here's this restaurant book that, by most standards, is kind of terrible. I mean, they forgot to bring me my food one night, <laughs> and the and then the and the server was like, "Oh yeah, where is your food? <laughs> this is so weird." <laughs> like, and so, like by most normal standards, like just like shouldn't even be considered a restaurant, maybe if they don't bring you food. But but uh, um, dancing, but like it was so it was more fun than a lot of places I was reviewing week to week, and I oh. and I just thought, what have they got that these other places are missing? What do they understand? Well, the thing is, I, I know that so many people thought, oh, you were you know, it was. I think people you know had such a great fun time with the review, but people thought you were being classist or whatever. And I had to say to them, no, no, no. This was this is not irony. This was actual fun, and you and I developed a system of breaking down the population from that visit there because we were sort of thinking about would this person join the conga line yeah right and i mean that's the <laughs> ultimate test would, would you wear the balloon hat and get on the conga line or are you too good for the balloon hat yes and and for the shot of whatever that horrifying cocktail into your mouth from from a stranger like it's yeah and and the thing i, I still <laughs> break down people buy this would they get in the conga line i think this is actually how we need to pick our next president <laughs> would they oh, donald God. trump would not get oh, in the conga line would he no I don't know. no i don't think he would what mike if... pence would not get in the conga oh, line well, yeah <laughs> yeah, probably. Hillary would join the conga line. Probably. It would be, Hillary loves it would be conga. awkward. Yeah, yeah. I think Hillary, she, yeah. Beto would get in the conga line. Of course. He, yeah. I think he used to be in a conga band, right? Yeah. I, I uh, think Alex AOC, I think, would, uh, you know, she's a great bartender, in fact. That's right. And, like, she, she could, could be, be pouring in, <laughs> pour in the, the shot. The mystery cocktail. Yeah. She could, yeah, she could be. I mean, that, I think that reaction you're talking about is more of the 
that kind of projection and yeah. and uh, um, you mean uh, transference thing. The, absolutely. The, it's like, well, it's the New York Times. They must, you know, being this august institution, they must be looking down their, their noses at yeah. this. Joe America. <laughs> yeah, right, which I got a ton of with the Barrio. I mean, excuse me, the the, uh, the um, uh, Guy Fieri review. Uh, I got a ton of that. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the real America and the New York Times and the elitist East Coast, blah, 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 shoot me now. Like, right. um, but phew, that that really came, it was, it was and, and in full force, it was a little preview of um, what um, um, the Make America Great Again uh, was, was going to, treat us all to you think you're better a few than us? years yeah, yeah wells yeah. um but the but absolutely the the new york times is is a, the what people imagine the new york times to be plays a huge huge role in that the thing also that i saw in you writing the the senior frogs r- review versus the the per se one because you put blood sweat and tears into per se i know that was also not into senior frogs uh, oh no! True, true. But like, but there was joy that went into this, and there was existential angst <laughs> that that went, went into to this. And uh, I, I think I was genuinely worried about you <laughs> during that time because I love you, and uh, and you know it was also I think in a December or January needed, when, when neither one of us is in an especially great mood. <laughs> I needed the prescription that Senor Frog had. <laughs> you, you've got a, you've got the, the fever <laughs> that only uh, Froggy Froggy birthday. No, 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 no. I wish everybody could. There is a video I put up on YouTube of uh, what happened that night. Pete is not in it, but Mr. Jason Biggs, excellent sport, was, was in there. Um, we, we lied and said it was his birthday and uh, things happened. But uh, so you take joy in it. And you and I have talked about this uh a fair amount and I think this is actually going to be really useful for writers listening to this it's hard to write yes yeah it's always better to be done but starting I mean I think people look at you who is one of the true and I thought this about you before you had the job and, and stuff like you've always been a writer who I admired the end product tremendously and I sort of loved it even more once I realized that you struggle too. It's hard for me to write. It's really difficult to make myself sit down and do it. Vivance has helped recently. I got diagnosed with ADHD, which actually has helped a lot. But sitting down and do it is, is, is a really hard, difficult thing. I procrastinate and I get the sense that you may as well. Yeah, I read something really really helpful about that and it was actually I think it was in my my paper and it had to do with like you know stay off the internet when you're when you're (laughs) trying to get work done and there was some expert I have no idea what this person's expertise was but some expert was quoted saying like you know the reason you go on the internet is that whatever you're procrastinating you're procrastinating because it's work which is, seems so obvious, but like, but yeah. just to be told that like you, you're procrastinating something because it's going to be hard, and you don't. And your brain would rather do the easy thing of looking at corgi videos. They're good, corgi videos. Do you have any? Uh, any on my? I can could pull we see one some up. corgi videos I can, now. I can show you a Penelope video. Oh, <laughs> could we? <laughs> Penelope's my dog. It's a long, low dog, and uh, oh. and I think she and Pete are soulmates. What did you call her? Long. Oh, uh, long and low. Oh, she long is, and low. Yeah, 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 yeah. She has that that. She got a low root, rider. Root beer barrel uh, <laughs> body. Yeah. yeah, she does. But it's it's. I, I think it's. I think it's really valuable for people to know that even somebody who operates in your position and at your level has a hard time doing it. There's just there's there's work that has to be done inside your head. Um, bef- but. I mean, some people can do it on paper, actually, and, and I admire that, but I don't have that skill. There's work that has to be done inside my head that has to do with, like, all the basic stuff that's going to be, that's going to become the foundation of the writing, which is, like, you know, 
where are we going to start? Where are we going to where are we going to start shining the spotlight? Where's the spotlight going to move to? How are we going to? Well, how much weight are we going to put on this versus that? And and what even what tone of voice are we going to use? Are we going to yeah. sound? Are we going to do questions? Right, are you going to right. be is all it, like, oh, this is a positive? Right, right, uh, right. And uh, um, and if you're starting, and if you've got good news and bad news, how much? Which one do you start with, and how much of it do you give before you pivot over to the bad news, and then do you try to reconcile them, or do you just leave it and say, "Yeah, there's good news and there's bad news, and that's life." Um, like, there's a lot to be done, and the first few paragraphs are kind of where you make all of the decisions about how you you're you're going to do it, and they're they're real decisions, and um, and they have consequences, uh, and. That's work, and if you don't, it, it's the it's if you don't do it now, you're gonna have to do it later. Uh, and I'm trying to to just orient myself toward it a little more, um, a, a little more. Um, uh, I don't know what's the what's the word. Um, uh, honestly, and say like, okay, there's this work that needs to be done, and if I go look at the corgis i will have <laughs> seen corgis which is a positive <laughs> thing but i also have avoided the work and i'm gonna have to do it again three hours later when i'm tired of looking at corgis Pete, every, 36 hours later every <laughs> restaurant you go into is going to have corgis on the placemat now <laughs> it's with, but not on the menu it's good no god no <laughs> I'm I'm getting the wrap up sign, but I have two, a couple things I want to ask you before the speed round. One is, um, what do you wish chefs understood about what you're doing? Corgis have to be roasted very <laughs> slowly oh, at a low temperature. Um, oh, that just that it's not personal. I mean, that's the main thing, and and the ones who've been in the business a long time get that but they still have a hard time they, you know there are things that you know intellectually that you have a hard time uh, metabolizing and I think that's one of them that you know just as when we civilians are criticized by someone we love or someone who has some authority over us like a boss or just by any random idiot you know our first reaction is never to say oh what if this person is right that's maybe our right. second or third or fourth reaction but our first first reaction is I'm going to kill you now right <laughs> or or I'm going to go hide under the bed for the next three days or something but it's it's never like oh that person just delivered me some interesting feedback right. about how I'm doing in the world I'll bet there's something in it that I should ponder no no and that's <laughs> yeah, not what it, that, and that's not what any chef is going to think getting a negative review first reaction right. is going to be personal they don't get it they, it's going to yeah. be personal no, and, and i then, understand right. that being yeah, yeah, yeah. loving a lot of chefs and yeah. stuff who but but it's never yeah. it's ne it's just yeah, never personal and i am always people. doing a job you know uh but it, you know the the people get i think know that but it's a long way from it's, knowing it to feeling it i i thoroughly understand that now there's a question that I ask of every guest because I, I believe in the, the openness of this, of using the secret and saying things out into the world so they can become true. Pete Wells, what do you want? You ask everybody this? Yeah. I, I, do they I, all freeze? Because I'm not just going to freeze. I'm not gonna... uh, yeah. No, I, I, I started doing it a few ago and uh, yeah. No, it takes a second to say something. Um, I, I have no idea. I mean, I'm, I'm stumped. Yeah, it's it's. Well, you're just gonna sit there until I come up with that. Yeah, yeah, because I text you this sometimes. Aren't you gonna run out of tape? Isn't this on a like a reel to reel <laughs> and the tapes? Gonna I know do, it's but. I because I, I text you this question sometimes. What do you want? What would make you happy? Oh come on! What does happiness have to do with any of it? I mean, it's not. It's not. It's certainly not the business of the the readers and the listeners at, at, at home. Although I hope they all find their own happiness. Uh, nope. Reaching into uh, the bag. Oh, this is what I want. Ah. 
Of course, coffee syrup is, is or is it? Mild, yes. It's mildly expired. You knew, and I didn't know mildly expired is <laughs> used by. Oh, that's nothing. There's that's and just a, that was just like two <laughs> months ago. That's not even expired. Doesn't even count as expired. And uh, this is so great. There's it's it's a re there's a reason I, I gave him this. Uh, it so would well, you well, explain does what? It, know what we're could you explain explain this? What this I just is gave a to you? <laughs> plastic bottle of Eclipse naturally flavored coffee syrup. Um, made uh, by the Finley Extracts Ingredients Company at 10 Blackstone Valley Place in Lincoln, Rhode Island. I grew up in the town next to Lincoln uh, and uh, drank a lot of coffee milk in my childhood because um, when you went to school there, the lunch ladies would, s would sell you regular milk or coffee milk or chocolate milk. And... Uh, um, so of course you would get the coffee milk right because anybody I mean, it's the official like, state drink yeah right so we were all you know uh, weaned on caffeine at an early age and uh um and yeah i have a i have a i do have a love for the coffee flavor that maybe is a little bit you know rhode island specific like i love coffee ice cream and Coffee syrup and it's all gonna be corgi and coffee. Corgis, <laughs> Every corgis and coffee. And there's a reason. Hi, for welcome that. to corgis and coffee. And there's a reason for the necklace as well. If you would say it in the voice. <gasps> hot wieners. You got hot wieners. Hot wieners up the um. <laughs> <laughs> there, it's a, it's also a Rhode Island. This is not a proper New York system wiener from Rhode Island, but. No, it's not. But I get it the, have I get the it. idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, so it's a, a wiener for, is it from a Onlyville? Yeah, <laughs> Onlyville system wiener. New York system. Yeah, so, it, so guys, uh, uh, or guys and, and gals, like, oh my God, I just used gendered language. Ah, um, if you want to make Mr. Wells happy, you'll do corgis and coffee milk and a hot wiener up the arm. Um, so we've got f five questions that I ask every guest. Also, speed round. Okay. I'll try not to blank I, out, but don't ask me about my emotional state. That's below the belt. <laughs> You'd be amazed at the answers we get. Um, we, what is your comfort food? Oh, I well, I'm not. I'm actually not sure. I have one. I mean, I have things that I eat that make me happy that I wouldn't 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 really serve anyone so like yeah like like I can I can get really into a bowl of oatmeal when the when the weather's right and and I think oatmeal is a little bit unpresentable you know <laughs> have you seen Instagram it's all oatmeal mm, that's the way I make it I don't know <laughs> like I they put you know yeah yeah I mean you have to do a lot of work to make oatmeal look fancy because it, it's not fancy. And again, coffee, milk, oatmeal, corgis. Yeah, I'm sort of amazed actually by the the uh, the um, uh, the that Instagram has enabled the rise of grain bowls. Because to me, the grain bowl is like Feels the like least work. appealing thing. But then I guess that it's it's this beige canvas <laughs> that you can put other you know colorful stuff on. Yeah. But not me. I don't have blackberries to put on my. Oatmeal. Oh, the I life of, a, of yeah. the New York Times food critic. My <laughs> favorite oatmeal lately, not that you asked, but my favorite oatmeal lately is um, uh, some dates, slice up some dates and a spoonful of um, orange marmalade. Mm. And it is delicious with buttermilk if you have buttermilk. And, uh, um, but it's not pretty. That sounds, uh, actually sounds kind of lovely. As it, you should try it. Yeah, I when I can eat grains again, I will. <laughs> so, what is the last meal that you had that made you emotional? Well, that's a really good. That's a really good question. It's probably been a while, and I'm and and uh, it's probably been a while, and I'm not. Uh, uh, I mean, well, I guess there are all kinds of emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, I could can, be rage. Can feel sort of <laughs> like happiness is a is a good one. <laughs> Is a good one actually. Yeah. I mean, I think I've, I've, I the um, I'm not, I'm not big on comfort food. It's sort of one of my pet peeves. Drives me a little bit bananas. But but I did feel very comforted by a lot of the Albanian food because it was it was a lot of like just delicious kind of like yogurty sauces with fluffy cornbread and this 
corn and meal thing, and it was, it was, there was just a lot of th- things that were like uh, um, simple and delicious, and but not of my culture, you know, yeah. of somebody else's culture. So it wasn't that, you know, th- there's always that idea in comfort food that you retreat to your own childhood, and that's part of what drives me crazy about it. But, oh, my childhood the, meals uh, sucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was somebody else's comfort food, maybe, and I and and. I, Got it. I also thought this this place just sort of had this l- lovely spirit of you know in, the, enjoying being at the table. Uh, I can't wait to go there. Yeah. So, what's the last meal that somebody cooked you in their home? Oh, I better get this right because if I don't, somebody's going to be really mad. Um, uh, and already there's somebody who's sort of tapping. A foot in impatience, wondering why I can't remember. Um, <laughs> Who knows when this airs, though? <laughs> can I think for a minute? Yeah. Can we have dead air while I think yeah. about it? And, um, I, well, and I could ask you the next question if you want to go back to that. Uh, sh- uh, sure, although, yeah, go ahead. Or if you want to think question. about it for a second. Um, holy heck, it wasn't that long ago, but I'm blanking on it. Um, Oh, I mean, I did have a really great Super Bowl meal that was all oh, yeah. that was home cooked, and that was that involved hot wieners uh, <laughs> and uh, coffee syrup, and uh, oh, they were gonna make Johnny cakes, but then the Johnny cakes got delayed. Was there some Dell's? We, there was Dell's lemonade. Yep, there was all <laughs> that, and then uh, and then there was some. Uh, Food from who else was in the Super Bowl besides the Patriots? There was another team. I'm. Uh, oh wait. <laughs> Our producer oh, yes. says they're right. So there's a there's other a town t- called Los Angeles, oh, okay. and they supposedly have food out there too. So there was some I, I of hear that. Nice yeah. things are happening. Yeah, yeah, Those yeah. crazy kids are uh, catching on. Right. So there was some whatever they eat out there. We had that. You were you were moved enough to text me a picture of your Super Bowl bounty, <laughs> which is pretty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. That was just exciting. And it was, really and it was, sweet. It was, it was it, thoughtful. You know, right? And and it was a, uh, you know, a lot a lot of work went into it. A lot of thought. I'm not sure that was the last one I. Had, but Who it's knows the first one that popped so. to mind. <laughs> um, what living musician would you want to cook for, and what would you feed them? Oh, ooh, ooh. you're a big music person. Oh gosh, you are like Boy, this is something people a, should know about Pete. That's such a he's good a huge one. music person. I mean, gosh, so many of the country, yeah, stars would have been so great, and then we've just watched them go one by one, you know, and. and uh, um, oh, they're not around, but Willie's around. Willie, you would not be Willie's the first around. person to answer Willie to that now. Yeah, what, what would you cook Willie? Um, Waylon's not around, right? I think Waylon checked out, so I can't cook for Willie and Waylon. I'm sorry, Waylon, if you're there, I'm I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, just uh, Dolly's just, around. <laughs> Right. Sure. Okay. Let's. That's what I would cook for. Uh, what would you cook? Thank for Dolly? you. I'll cook for Dolly. <laughs> I. W- uh, what would I cook for Dolly? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I would just. I would just try to make her as happy as she's made me. But I. I don't. It, you know. I think. One of the things great, the, the like the the great old time country stars did was they always made you feel like you were important you the fan you know i saw um tammy Wynette one time and uh uh she like w- was performing maybe at town hall and, and like had the limo drop her out in front of the theater and walk into the theater like maybe 45 minutes before the show hour before the show so all the fans rushed up with their autograph books and she stopped and signed every one of them and i was like this is amazing this is like like show business like it should be you know yeah. like it's just uh, that acknowledgement that like she you know wouldn't be there without the fans was incredible so anyway in my delusion i believe that that dolly would appreciate whatever i happen to cook 
I, I've had your food, and yeah. <laughs> Pete's a great cook, by the way. People may not know this, but uh, punch and, and large hunks of meat <laughs> are very much in his, his I world. might not give Dolly like a large hunk of meat. I might try to do something a little, a Some, little more, like... A little more delicate. But I think she's she, a small person. She is, but I think she'd get down with your cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. You've got five minutes uninterrupted for self-care. What do you do? Oh, God, I'm so glad you didn't say five minutes to live. <laughs> I hate that question so No, much. I'm not looking to your mortality. You're going to be a yeah. restaurant critic at the times till we... till. The times is gone. <laughs> okay, I have five minutes of what did you call self, it? Uninterrupted self care time. Nobody, your phone is not there. Your yeah, I'm not sure I understand the concept of self care. I've heard about it. Yeah, it seems to be a is that a Gwyneth thing? Is that a thing <laughs> that Gwyneth does? I, I think it might involve a, a, a hotel bathroom and some donuts. Okay, and fine. Okay. Oh, I'm there. Would it involve cake vodka? Oh, only if you were there, not. <laughs> Cake vodka solo is maybe not my idea of happiness, but cake vodka with a friend. Yeah. Yeah, very much. <laughs> Cheers, Pete Wells. Thank you, Kat. Thank you so much to our guest today, Pete Wells. And you can find him on Twitter at Pete underscore Wells. You can't find him on Twitter at all because he, he <laughs> stays away. But you, you can... You know, see some old things he wrote a long time ago. Uh, Pete Wells is also in the New York Times, and he's also standing right behind you. <laughs> and you can, and, uh, yeah, you can find links to all of his socials, whether they are populated or not, and to his <laughs> writing in the episode description. Thank you to our producers, Jennifer Martnick, Alicia Cabral, and Amy Frank. Thank you to Douglas Wagner for our delightful theme song. If you like what you heard, please tell a friend and write a review or rate us. And if there is something you would like us to talk about or a guest you would like to hear more from please let us know you can find me on twitter where i'm overactive at kitten with a whip find out more about the show and catch up on all the episodes at foodandwine.com and food and wine's youtube page thank you for listening and take good care of yourself until the next time